The more energy you give, the more he's going to have. Please give it up for Andy Dinnick for guitar, everybody. Let him hear it. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. There we go. Getting a little bit awake this morning. Good to see at least some of you are caffeinated. Some of you are clearly hungover. Uh, I can relate. It's a conference hazard that we all uh, have to deal with from time to time. So, uh, welcome to Avoiding Digital Training Wrecks, the worst, the most awful session at Internet Summit 2016. I'm glad so many of you chose to spend half an hour of your life with me. I hope it's not disappointing. I hope it's a lot of fun and uh, something that you can take some things away with as well, things not to do. So, I'm your host, Andy Diddick. I'm VP of Account Services at Intara. And uh, we're here with uh, our CMS partner, Kenico. We're just down the hallway. We've got some great giveaways. Uh, we'd love to see you down at the booth. Feel free to come over and say hello. Uh, in Tara, just to give you a real quick overview, I promise I've got a timer here, so this won't take more than 45 seconds. We're a digital agency, and we serve three specific verticals. We work with technology companies, brand manufacturers, and healthcare institutions. We help them to create uh, great, innovative digital user experiences uh, through management consulting, and uh, through technical integrations, and through creative digital services. So that's really cool. Um, we are located, as you can see here, I'm going to try and do my best with this uh, slow thing that, that uh, that won't keep up with me. Uh, we're located in East Tennessee, and specifically in Johnson City. Now, not a lot of people have heard of Johnson City, but if you have, you may have heard of us through a particular song. And I'm taking some risks here this morning, because it's 9.15, I haven't warmed up yet, but I'm going to attempt to, to maybe familiarize you with the song a little bit. Does anybody know the song, Wagon Wheel? Okay, all right, great. By the way, Darius Rucker didn't write it. He just made it popular. So, in Wagon Wheel, Johnson City is featured. And the line goes, <clears throat> Heading on west to the Cumberland Gap, to Johnson City, Tennessee. Right? Okay. All right. So that was good. Now, I'm going to blow your minds before we even get started on digital disasters, because this really bothers me as somebody who likes facts. Let me show you something. The Cumberland Gap, whoops, here we go. I told you this thing's going to have a hard time keeping up. I'm going to talk fast. I click fast. Cumberland Gap. There's the Cumberland Gap in Tennessee, and Johnson City is located here. Now, for you geography buffs out there, which direction is Johnson City from the Cumberland Gap? That is correct. So, while Darius Rucker and the Oprah Winston Show did a great job popularizing our town, it's a wonderful place in the foothills of Appalachia. Actually, this picture was taken somewhere near us. Uh, we are actually east of the Cumberland Gap, not west, as the song would suggest. So, I hope, if nothing else, you take away from this presentation. It's geographical. Facts. So here we go. Now actually what you're supposed to get out of this is you're supposed to be able to identify five things to ensure digital marketing success and, uh, and at least learn how they're a disaster if you don't do them. Um, you're going to be able to convince and empower your team to become more agile, like a tiger. Uh, you're going to strengthen your existing relationship between marketing and IT, and if not, you're going to do some speed dating and help you learn how to get along with them better. Uh, and hopefully you're going to ready your organization for better collaboration with an agency and learn how to folks work, work with folks like us to help do awesome stuff for you. So with that, let's get right into it and get started. We're going to start with the first train wreck that we're going to talk about today. And this one takes place in Italy. Now, lucky for you, in addition to being a geography buff, I also know how to do research, which I did all my research on Italy on Shutterstock. And I found out that according to Shutterstock, uh, Italian men are very passionate. They, uh, they like football and soccer. Um, Italian women wear very large, oversized glasses, a lot of makeup, and stare lovingly at plates of uh, cut meat. Um, this is what you see here, so that's, that's a lot about Italy. But, but in all seriousness, it's the land of Amore. And, and in 2015, Italy was struggling with a serious problem that they needed marketing help with. You see, in, at the end of 2015, they tallied up all of the newborn babies in Italy, and they found out that the Italians had made 488,000 babies, which is a lot of children. I mean, I have four, and, and that's enough. Like, 488,000 is a lot of kids. So. What's interesting about this is that that's the fewest number of live births in Italy since the state was incorporated as a country in 1881. And that presents all kinds of challenges to a government. When you have a negative birth rate, you're not able to keep, take care of uh, social, their equivalent of social security, your economy doesn't grow, real estate doesn't grow, that sort of thing. So marketing to the rescue, uh, Italy engaged Beatrice Lorenzen, who's their health minister, who wasn't necessarily a qualified marketer, but thought she knew a thing or two to do a campaign, because what's better to have people make a base than digital media? Uh, at least that's what some websites would have me believe that are in my browsing history. Uh, they, they had her uh, create 
create a campaign, and, and without a whole lot of research or forethought, they launched this gem. This is Italian Fertility Day, September 20, uh, 2015. And uh, now, I happen to, I didn't see the Holiday Inn Express last night, but I do have a path in the double tree by Hilton that makes me fluent in Italian. So let me tell you what these things say. This, uh, this gem here says, uh, don't, uh, don't let your sperm go up in smoke. And uh, this one here with the hourglass, my laser's not quite what it should be, uh, says beauty has no age limit, but fertility does. So, oh yeah, we're, we're hearing some laws at least from the ladies right now. Uh, this is great too. Um, the, the one with the water there, fertility is a common good. Gets me in the mood. Uh, and uh, the one with the picture of the, the feet says uh, young parents, best at being creative. And then finally, my favorite, because nothing gets me in the mood like this does. The Constitution protects conscious and responsible procreation. <laughs> Think about that. Next time you roll by Adam and Eve, or you know, you're know you in the mood of that special somebody, just remember what the Constitution protects, baby. So, obviously, the response to this was uh, somewhat predictable. Um, a slew of negative headlines in both Italian and international press. This thing was a clear and immediate disaster. Uh, Beatrice tried to save this by saying, hey, we're just trying to start a conversation about fertility. We weren't actually trying to get people to have kids. Uh, but the prime minister kind of cut her legs out from under when he said, hey, I don't know about you, but I don't know any of my friends that decided to have children based on seeing an advertisement. So she got into a lot of trouble. And what's really interesting about this, and the thing that you can take away for your digital project, is that what was truly bad uh, was that the reason that people, women in Italy, and couples are not having children has to do with serious social issues, uh, like a lack of social services and support, and also, remember I'm feeling fluent Italian now, uh, a bizarre social construct there called dismissione in bianco. It's my Italian for you today. Which means that hundreds of thousands of women are forced to sign uh, undated letters of resignation in the country uh, so that if they become pregnant, the employer can just write a date in, and they're gone. Yeah, not good. And it's Italy, it's, it's supposed to be impressive, right? But anyway, the campaign clearly failed to address the things that really matter. So, and that's why it was a huge disaster for them. So what can we learn from this? Well, the question you should ask, and, and the process that we use in our projects, is to make sure you conduct stakeholder interviews. Are you asking the right people the right questions? Don't make assumptions that just because uh, Beatrice uh, was uh, 43 at the time of the, uh, the campaign going out, she figured she pretty well knew the target demographic. I know young women, right? I'm, I am one of them. Uh, but are you asking the right people the right questions who you really can ask? Um, in, a, in your digital process, it's important to talk to executives. Uh, it's important to talk to HR and recruiting, especially if you're building websites. There are all sorts of things that are, are considerations for HR and recruiting that you may not be thinking of. Uh, you need to talk to sales because you're dealing with their customers. And of course, IT, we're going to get into you guys a little bit later. I know from the demographic study, about 10% of you here are from IT, so I've got a special segment just for you. Uh, talking to accounting is important, as well as talking to new hires, people who are brand new to the organization, who have a unique perspective as to why they joined and how they see your company today. And also, find a person who's part of the old guard that's been there for a while. Um, inevitably, she's probably named Dolores and has been there for 25 years. But you need to find your Dolores that can warn you of historical landmines that the company's engaged in. In this day and age, people moving from company to company, it's really important to find somebody with some history and not just assume that, that things were happening. So that is train wreck number one. And uh, we're gonna get right into train wreck number two. Now, I, I know we're hung over from a couple of things. One of them is the election this morning. So don't worry, this is not a political statement. This is a technological statement. What we need to pay attention to in our digital projects around healthcare.gov. Um, I think as, uh, since this is something that affects all of us, I think all of us know a few things about healthcare.gov and the, the train wreck that it was when it first went live. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people hit the site, uh, went live by government mandate, um, and, and it was a huge disaster that nobody could get into. And two months after it went live, it was a huge disaster that nobody could get into. There was a congressional inquiry. I don't know about you, but none of my failed campaigns have had a congressional inquiry, so let me sweat a little bit. Uh, but it, there, there, there's no real consensus as to what went wrong here, but there are some findings from key analysts that point to a couple of specific things. So first of all, taking a look at this project, complex data integration and technical requirements were a huge part. 
this was a government disaster, but it was also a really difficult project. And I know a lot of you have big, difficult projects to deal with as well. Um, you had to deal with the needs of ordinary citizens, with the needs of private businesses and employers, um, as well as individual insurers. They had to deal with identity management. Um, one of the things that they did was it required you to enter a social security number before you could get a quote. So managing people's social security number over the web was really important. And it had to interface with over 50 states that had 50 different Medicare plans, each with their own years of regulation and their own technical systems that were unique to each state. This is a huge deal, okay? We need to cut them a little bit of slack because it really was a very complicated problem. Now, I'll tell you, uh, we're, we're a mid-sized agency, we're about 50 people, but if I had a budget of $174 million, which this did, I'd probably find a way to make it work. But um, they did spend a ton of money and weren't able to get the results they needed. And also had to collaborate with four government agencies, Medicaid, the IRS, the Department of Homeland Security, and uh, also the Social Security Office. So at the core of all of this, what went wrong and caused this to be such a massive PR debacle uh, and an embarrassment for the country as a whole? Well. If you look at the way that a process should be managed for a project that this is this big, and uh, the company I work for, we've deployed pages, uh, we've deployed websites to millions of pages in 172 countries, over 40 languages, so we get how this is supposed to work. Uh, you're supposed to start by defining your goals and requirements, move into design. I know I'm educating all of you right now, right? You're writing this down seriously. You've never seen this before. Uh, you have iterations here, uh, and you get into the build phase. And then you spend just as much time in the testing and QA phase, if not more, as you do in the build phase and design. Because you realize that once you get into actually building something digital, you go, huh, this didn't work the way that I thought it would. Even though I did a lot of due diligence to begin with, this, this isn't quite how I thought it should work, and we can make this better. Um, and then before you launch to the public, you do private launches and betas, and you do it real you know, incrementally so that when you screw up, it's small. If you fail fast, fail small. We're all familiar with this. We've heard it a million times, probably even at this conference. Now, we do have some leaked documents uh, from this project that show how they actually managed this project from a digital standpoint. And here's how that went. So requirements process went a little bit long because nobody in government could agree what the requirements were. Uh, in fact, it went so long that it continued throughout the majority of the design process. And the build process got started before the design process was finished, and by the way, before the requirements were done being gathered as well. And then they proceeded immediately to a large public launch. They cut QA time from months, which probably would have been inadequate to begin with, to a few weeks. And despite 18 written memos to senior executives who were in charge of both the contracts as well as the government offices, uh, the site went live because it had to go live due to a government mandate had to because of a law. Uh, and so it was a huge embarrassment and a huge problem uh, with, with massive financial and, and PR consequences. So um, this is something we don't want to do. So what can we take away from this? One of them is as you're going through your project, whether it's a campaign or it's a site build or it's an app you're building, you need to make sure you're asking the right technology questions. You need to be sure that you're documenting all of your integrations. Integrations need to be dealt with first. So the first thing you're going to talk about with requirements is determining what data sources need to feed, what other data sources, and what can we afford to be a manual process versus something that truly has to be automated. So figure those things out in advance. Also ask the question, hey, what else is going on in IT right now? Whether you're with a small company or a big one, there are inevitably dependencies that are occurring at the same time, both from a resources standpoint as well as a technological one. Finally, are you listening to developers? Really? I know 85% of you here are marketers. I'm a marketer, uh, and I'm also a sales guy. And I'm, one thing I'm not for sure is a developer. Uh, and it's easy to dismiss the developers when they come to you in whatever stereotypical fashion the developer you're imagining in your mind's eye comes to you. Uh, I know, I see. Um, and they come to you and say, hey, hey, this is a problem, this, just, this isn't going to work. And you kind of dismiss it as like, yeah, but the client needs this, or, or yeah, but the boss says this, or hey, the, the federal government's going to shut down and we don't launch on time. Uh, whatever it is, make sure you listen to them and document those things and figure out what things truly are showstopper and are not. And, and finally, you need to ask yourself, is my relationship with IT less than loving? Is it? If it is, I can hook you up with Beatrice to give you a digital campaign and make it better. Uh, but really, if there's any type of hostility or intangibles between you working well with IT, get those fixed. 
figure out what they are, take somebody out for coffee, have, have, a, have a lunch and learn on you and the marketing department, and, and make an effort to bridge that gap because nothing can happen in the digital world. These two departments are getting closer, they're not going further away. Nothing can happen without them. So that's my, that's my PSA for the IT folks, the few and far between that are here. Uh, represent. Okay. All right, now we're going to get into uh, trademark number three, uh, which is Amazon Prime Day. I, I don't know if any of you are familiar, but um, Amazon has managed to pull off a, a coup along the scale of uh, De Beers with, with making diamond engagement rings a uh, cultural norm, or whoever came up with Valentine's Day and makes a dozen roses $150 instead of you know, 15 bucks a program. Uh, they invented their own holiday in the middle of the summer called Amazon Prime Day. The first year for it was Yak last year. It was a huge success. Uh, they pulled in, they shipped more orders and pulled in more money than they did on Black Friday in 2015. So when 2016 rolled around, there was a ton of hype. And Prime Day is when they put as much of their catalog as possible on sale and offer deep discounts and incentives for people to sign up for their Prime program uh, that allows you to get free shipping and music streaming and that kind of stuff. Uh, and they keep ratcheting up the cost. Uh, I remember it was 50, 50 bucks to join. Uh, now it's $100. But anyway, we got into this year, and all of a sudden, the Prime Day hashtag started trending just as much as the Prime Day fail hashtag. And I'm going to show you why. One of the problems with this campaign, <laughs> yeah, you guys think quicker than I do. I looked at this and said, what, what's so funny about this? What's the deal? So uh, one of the problems that Amazon has is that their stuff is really low prices already, and 100% of their campaign focuses around the price drops. So if you look here, you've got a PlayStation 4 console, which, by the way, is mandated by the manufacturer or a lot of manufacturers. This is IMAP pricing that the minimum that they're allowed to sell it for is $399.99. I guarantee you they got penalized by Sony for doing this. They dropped the price a whopping four cents to $399.95. Uh, math majors can figure out what the percentage is. It's probably not that much. And from the responses like this, but some mad savings happening now on Amazon, guys. This is incredible. It's amazing. So uh, they also put anything they did have a legitimate deal on, they front loaded at midnight. So if you're up at midnight, you can get some pretty good deals on Amazon Electronics and a few things. But if you waited to get up like the rest of us at a reasonable time, like 10 or 11 in the morning, um, this is the crap that awaited you when you opened your eyes that morning. Um, so that was a big challenge. They also decided to promote literally everything like a garage sale fashion. So you've got here a, a screaming deal on nut milk bags, uh, which are, and they're my best. They're my best nut milk bags, um, which when my marketing team brought this to me, I was, I was like, we say nut milk bags? We can't. So they legit. It's okay. Uh, and uh, I love the comment here, load up on your nut milk bags, people. It's Prime Day. Best deals on nut milk bags of the year. Uh, also, something that should have shown up in my, in my dad's uh, Prime inbox and not mine, uh, also had some screaming deals on VCR or wine. So, come uh, on into the room, look it up. Um, you won't understand. But uh, I remember, please be kind, rewind, uh, and, and, you know, running the VHS tape. So, huge, huge deal on that. Act fast. Uh, really important. And I love this. Uh, Prime Day is a bigger disappointment than I am for my parents. Uh, fantastic. So Amazon's getting lampooned for the choices that they make. But then things go from bad to worse for Amazon. Because not only do they have a problem with the selection and the messaging, but people started to add things to the cart and started getting these error messages. Add to cart, fail. Fail. I can't add anything to my cart. I'm trying to give you my money. It's sad to wake up early for Prime Day and not be able to add to the cart. Notice the time there, 9 or 3 a.m. probably. <laughs> Somebody like me or, yeah, I'll pick on the line. We painted a lot of money over this conference. Really, they are very important, but they don't, they don't get up early. I can say that categorically every week. Uh, so anyway, you're not able to add things to, to the cart. There was a, a huge deal. Even Amazon, Monster, the biggest e-commerce company in the world, hadn't low tested their servers for the influx of uh, orders that they were going to get as a result of this. Even as unsuccessful as, as it was, uh, in some ways, it was very successful in terms of volume again, and people weren't able to add things to their cart. So you need to ask yourself a question in your digital project. Are we ready if something goes wrong? And it's important to remember, too, that when it comes to asking this question, you also need to ask the question, are we ready if something goes really, really right? And people do show up despite being for nut milk bags and VCR rewinders. And they do want to check out, and they can't. So what that means for you in your digital projects is to assess your operational readiness before you get started. Build a risk register. 
And that's not just a boring project management term. This can be something you can sit down for 45 minutes in a conference room and <coughs> brainstorm real quickly. Hey, what could go wrong? And then a mitigation strategy, that's a really fancy project management term. And all that means is saying, if this goes wrong, or if this goes right, what are we going to do? What's the consequence? What's our plan? And then you're prepared if things happen. Very important to do. Do extensive load testing and QA. Any competent agency that's working for you or your internal team should be able to do this. Run your processors on your servers at 100% for a day and a half. You know, really bog things down. Test your bandwidth. Find the weak points and ensure that you're going to be ready when things spike even much more successfully uh, than you hoped that they would. Um, actually, I'm ready to move this entire wall over in case more people come in and want to hear my talk. I, I talked to him beforehand and said it would be okay. Uh, so I'm ready as well. I practice what I preach. And finally, play to your strengths. If you're Amazon, your prices are already low, but don't promise low prices on electronics and things you can't do that for. Um, focus on what you're really good at. Amazon is great at recommending. They're the best at recommending what things you might like. Uh, in fact, that's why I don't have my personal browser history, uh, my Amazon history up here. I've gotten in a lot of trouble when I'm bringing new clients looking stuff up. So uh, I, I never show it to anybody, but they really know what I think is funny at 2 a.m. in a bar in uh, downtown Atlanta. Uh, but play your strengths, they should be recommending things that matter to people. The nut milk bags never should have shown up. The VCR winder never should have shown up on the, pe the people who are actively using Twitter and, uh, and not interested in those things. So play your strengths. All right, we're going to round things out. I'm going to criticize Apple. Easy. Easy. I say a lot of glowing apples, but don't worry, we're going to criticize Samsung. So we'll be fair to everybody. Um, for this one, we're going to go back to the archives, way back to the dark ages of 2014. And we're going to go way back and, and take a look at what uh, Apple did under the tutelage of CEO Tim Cook when they launched the iPhone 6. Um, a lot of you here, again, I see the glowing apples or iPhone users, you remember this happening to you. And it's right, it's a campaign that happened to you. Uh, because when they launched the iPhone 6, Apple decided, hey, people like iPhones. We're selling a whole lot of them. People like you too. They're arguably the most popular rock band on the planet. Why don't we just give everybody who has an iPhone uh, uh, an album, uh, YouTube's newest album? It'd be a great PR stunt. People will love it. You know, uh, everybody, the average human with a dad bod who's rocking an iPhone is going to love this thing. It's going to be fantastic. Well, uh, what they did was they dropped. 500 million copies of the album on everybody's iPhone in the country. And the results were a little mixed. Um, millennials, this guy was born in 96. I do love millennials. I'm technically a millennial, actually. But he said, uh, what is you do? And why is it a gift? You can keep that. Uh, this person was complaining, I don't even have enough storage on my iPhone 2. They were rocking an iPhone 2. Uh, to, to, so what makes Apple think that I want the YouTube album to be automatically downloaded? This person said, count me among those that are upset that this thing automatically downloaded on my phone. Uh, and then it got more and more creative as time went on. Hey, Tim Cook, I want a virus called YouTube. How do I install it? What can I do? And I love this one. I want to make sure I read it correctly for emphasis. Swear to God, if a YouTube song come on my shuffle while I'm working out, I'm getting an Android. <laughs> Some people got a little deeper and more philosophical and simply said, why not is you too on my iPhone? <laughs> so the big problem here was, was Apple assuming that that's what people wanted. And to make it worse, uh, you weren't able to undo easily what the company did to you. You actually had to navigate it. They really quickly emerged and put up this, this page on the site. It's still there, by the way. It's still, I, I pulled this down last night, because uh, that's when I built most of this presentation. Uh, to say, remove the iTunes gift songs of innocence, uh, that was the name of the album, from your phone. They've got a whole list of instructions because if you pull it off your phone, it remains in your iTunes, pull it off your iTunes, it remains on your phone, it's a huge mess. Right? So they really pissed a lot of people off. And, and it seemed like such a great idea in the beginning that a lot of people in the room were going, yeah, yeah, I too, you know, you too, I, I, I thought it was great. Um, but it begs the question does your organization have insights into your customers' behavior, sentiment, and intangible needs? Whether you're running a small social campaign uh, or, or some big integration that's serving a bunch of different stakeholders internally only, you have to ask this question. Because at the core of this train wreck is the assumption that all the users of the phone were the same person, that would appreciate the same things. So you need to ask yourself and perform some customer segmentation. You need to do some research that goes beyond the demographics that you know that the majority of iPhone holders between the ages of 18 and 65, therefore they all fall in the same category. 
Uh, you need to look at their needs, their attitudes, and their behaviors, and how they differentiate from one another, and find segments that you can market, market to and target differently. You need to test those segments. We've talked about personalization for years, and I would guess that very few of you are able to do that really well because it's very intensive to do. But figuring out who your basic segments are and, and doing some really simple segmented marketing is actually pretty easy, and it's, it's really smart being able to do it. Uh, and, and finally, respect those segments. Once you know who they are, um, if, you, if your data is telling you you're only going to get a 0.1% a, a conversion rate, but you might piss some people off in doing a particular campaign, just don't do it. Just find a way to, in your heart to resist that extra bump in the sales because you really need to draw more negative PR than is ever worth doing anything to work. So that's really important. Now, for my last and fifth segment, uh, the last and fifth disaster. I'm going to pick on Samsung, so I promise I would be equal. Um, I actually took this uh, picture myself. I was in Miami uh, coming back, and I've been traveling a lot over the last couple of months. And it's been interesting because as I've been on the plane, sitting down, it started with just announcements of, hey, if you got a, a Samsung Galaxy Note 7, please make sure it's in the off position, not just airplane mode. It's really important. And then it kind of escalated a little bit to, if you have an iPhone 7, you need to let a crew member know immediately. Right? I'm sorry, iPhone, a Galaxy Note 7. You need to let a crew member know immediately. And then it escalated to this, this like gigantic, this is, this is almost six feet tall, <laughs> prohibited on all flights, here's the 1-800 number, no way in hell this is going on an airplane, okay? I would say, even though this isn't a digital campaign, I'm going to tell you some things you can take away from it in a minute, but this is a massive disaster and a train wreck for Samsung, uh, arguably worse than U2L. So I'm going to give you a little bit of timeline uh, of how this unfolded and see if you members of the studio audience can come to the conclusions that I did of how this can impact our digital projects. So really, really simple timeline of the disaster. In August, some phones exploded. <laughs> um, and <laughs> Samsung leadership went to their thousands of employees and QA, very, very smart engineers, some of the smartest minds in the planet, and said, hey, go find out why the phones exploded. And the engineers spent a lot of time, hundreds of thousands of man hours testing, had all the resources at their disposal, and guess what? couldn't replicate it. They didn't know why the phones were exploding. And because this is such a huge flagship product for Samsung, the executives said, well, we got to pick something. What do you think it is? They said, oh, it's probably the batteries. Batteries explode. Uh, and so, you know, they said, hey, it was the batteries, even though they didn't have proof of it. And they issued a recall for the first set of phones and began issuing the next set of phones that had new batteries in them. Seemed like everything was going to be okay for about two days. And then some more phones exploded later <laughs> And they were like, oh shoot, it's not the batteries like we thought it was. I guess that's one way to eliminate a variable in your troubleshooting, right? Just see what happens. If stuff keeps exploding, well, no, it wasn't the batteries. Uh, so they, 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 they issued a, a second recall and they started to really feel the heat. Uh, and yeah, that's what they said. I don't think it wasn't the batteries after all. And then in October, they recalled the entire product line. And, uh, and started issuing these, these big recalls because they, they weren't just, I mean, they were exploding in people's pockets and causing burns, over 55 reports of injuries and property damage, huge, huge debacle. And uh, in addition to being a PR nightmare and giving my snobby Apple friends enough reason to thumb their nose up at me, uh, it also had a serious financial impact for them. Uh, they had an 8% drop in their entire stock value, uh, eliminating overnight $17 billion worth of marketing valuation. It's a huge amount of money, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's actually more than the GDP of a lot of uh, small island nations, just gone overnight because of a trade wreck. So what can we learn from this, uh, besides the fact that you know, don't, don't trust the Samsung engineers when they say the batteries are okay? Uh, we, if you dig deeply into the problem, um, a couple of employees left the company, and they won't name names because they're afraid for their safety. But here's what they said. They said, there is a top-down culture at Samsung that's very militaristic and driven for profits and for excellence, which has its pluses and has its minuses. But when you're faced with a disaster like this, they found out that the engineers who were responsible for doing all of the testing of the phones to figure out why they were exploding and catching on fire weren't allowed to do any documentation in a digital format, via email, media, anything else, because Samsung was terrified of a lawsuit. They were more afraid about a lawsuit and potential legal implications and they were uh, concerned with actually fixing the problem. So I think we all know people like this within the organization. We all know executives that are hard drivers, want to get things out no matter what. And we all know legal teams that are going, oh, that's, 
that's not going to fly with protect ourselves. There's, there's no way. And, and, and unfortunately for us, I don't think there's anybody here in the room, I checked, Sam's not on the sponsor list, uh, that, that, has, um, that has any, uh, something like this on their hands. But you can have many Note 7 explosions going off for your customers. If you're not careful, you don't follow these last principles I'm going to leave you with today. So you need to ask, is my team and my culture aligned in a way that this can be successful? This digital initiative, whatever it is. Uh, you need to ask some key questions. Marketing, communications, and development have to be in sync. There were some early warning signs that there was, was going to be a problem with the phones. It's murky, we don't really know for sure exactly what happened, but more than likely, uh, somebody knew beforehand this was going to be an issue. And when they couldn't replicate it, um, engineering didn't have enough clout to be able to make the decision or to let marketing know uh, exactly what was going on to help gain in communication. A good PR firm could have, could have fixed this. You know, we all know about the famous story of the Tylenol recall. Uh, you know, a couple people got sick and died from Tylenol being contaminated with arsenic, and, and Tylenol didn't mess around. They pulled 32 million bottles of Tylenol off the shelves since like 81. And, uh, and in two months turned around and were selling more than ever before because they handled it really well as a PR win. Somebody could have helped us. The second thing you need to do is you need to keep your executives in check. In, I, I hope there are some heads rolling and saying something what happened. We do all know these executives that, that need to understand, I don't care how intimidating they are, what the ego is, there's a point where enough is enough and this campaign can't go live. And so finally, you need to not be afraid to pull the plug on your project 